My uh, talk today is about the globalization of in vitro fertilization and assisted reproductive technologies in general, which I'm going to be calling ARTs from this point on, and I will tell you what they are. And as a Middle Eastern scholar, I have been following um, the globalization of ARTs into the Islamic world, where I'm going to argue that the technologies have been received very enthusiastically over um, about 25 years, and I have to point out, even by the Shiyuk of the United Arab Emirates, who are there behind the conceived sign. So um, I hope to show how these reproductive technologies have led to new social and cultural transformations, including the development of a 21st century phenomenon called reproductive tourism. Furthermore, I hope to debunk what I think is a rather widely held Western myth of the Islamic world as somehow sort of fanatically religious and anti-scientific. Far from it, Islam is a religion that can be said to encourage science and technology, including medical developments to overcome human suffering. Islam, as we shall see, is scientifically agentive, encouraging the pursuit of high-tech medicine and science. And the continual development of new forms of assisted conception has led to the emergence of very interesting Islamic bioethical discourses on how these technologies should be used by Muslims. And so my theme today is emergence. First, the emergence of the assisted reproductive technologies themselves, the emergence of Islamic bioethical discourses surrounding the ARTs, the emergence of an ART industry in the Middle East, including, as I'm going to show you, new market demand for donor gametes, especially donor eggs, the emergence of what in anthropology we call local moral worlds, the sort of understandings of ART users, of what they're doing, the emergence of this new phenomenon being called reproductive tourism among Middle Eastern infertile couples, especially those seeking these gametes, and then finally, what I'm calling in a new book that's coming out next year, Emergent Masculinities, or how Arab men's engagement with assisted reproductive technologies are part and parcel of larger transformations in Middle Eastern men's lives. And my book is called The New Arab Man. <laughs> it took a while to settle on that title. But I am trying to argue that there's a lot going on in manhood and masculinity in the Middle East today. And I'm going to try to show that to you in the world that I work um, in by sharing a reproductive life history of a man who I'm going to call Iyad and his unlikely egg donor, hoping, hoping to bring together all of these different elements of emergence in a story from Beirut, Lebanon. So, the emergence of ARTs. In his seminal essay, Dominant, Residual, and Emergent, Marxist scholar Raymond Williams defined emergence in the most succinct but compelling fashion. Emergence, he said, involves new meanings and values, new practices, new relationships, and kinds of relationship which are continually being created. And the term emergence has great relevance in the world of ARTs. Since the birth in 1978 of England's Louise Brown, who was the world's first test tube baby, there has been a veritable explosion of ARTs related to IVF. And these would include intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which I've been working on in this new book called ICSI, which is to overcome male infertility, third-party reproductive assistance with donor eggs, donor sperm, donor embryos to overcome problems of poor gamete quality, gestational surrogacy to help women who are unable to carry a pregnancy, as well as for gay male couples, Cryopreservation, which is basically freezing and storage of unused um, eggs, sperm, embryos, and even ovarian tissue now can be frozen. Ooplasm transfer is an experimental technology, basically in which cytoplasm from a younger fertile woman's eggs is removed and put into the eggs of an older woman, perimenopausal woman, to try to improve her egg quality. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis um, is being used with IVF to determine if embryos have genetic defects, to select embryos of a specific sex, or to select embryos that can grow into savior siblings through the donation of their umbilical cord blood. Human embryonic stem cell research is basically being done on unused embryos um, from IVF laboratories for the purposes of future therapeutic intervention. And there is not yet, but the future possibility of human reproductive cloning, 
which would be a kind of asexual autonomous reproduction which has already occurred in other mammals most famously dolly the sheep and has been experimented on in terms of of humans it's not there yet but the future is is actually there with human reproductive cloning now with virtually all of these technologies um sperm and eggs are taken out of human bodies um and actually the procedure is basically a woman's ovary is stimulated through hormonal medications to make a lot of eggs sort of develop in follicles these are aspirated out of her ovary meanwhile a man ejaculates into a plastic cup and his sperm are taken with her eggs put into a petri dish in the laboratory and for 24 to 78 hours they're allowed to fertilize um, incubate and then with the formation of embryos the embryos are then transferred it's called embryo transfer back into the womb of the woman and so that is the basic uh, process and sometimes these embryos once created can be donated to other couples the same thing with the eggs and the sperm so these things can be disaggregated and sort of set, sent off into other places besides you know the couple who donated um, I also have to say that um, in November 2010, at about this time last year, um, this man, Professor Robert Edwards, a professor at Cambridge, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, although he was so enfeebled he couldn't go to pick up the award. But he um, is shown here with Louise Brown on the right, her mother, who was infertile, and her son, who was just created through natural conception. But she is now, uh, she is now, 33, 34 years old, and there's been a lot of sort of media attention to her life cycle as she goes forward. Okay, so that is the basic stuff about ARTs. Now the emergence of Islamic bioethical discourses. IVF globalized quickly, moving to the Middle East within eight years of Louise Brown's birth. Today, the Middle East is host to a booming and high-tech ART industry. Egypt alone boasts more than 50 IVF clinics, Iran has more than 70 clinics, and Turkey has the largest number with over 110 clinics. Even a small country such as the United Arab Emirates boasts more than a dozen IVF centers, including two supported by the Emirati state. The development of a Middle East IVF industry is not surprising. Islam encourages the use of science and medicine as solutions to human suffering, and is a religion that can be described as pronatalist, encouraging the growth of an Islamic multitude. Yet relatively little is known about Islam and technoscience, if technoscience is defined broadly as the interconnectedness between science and technology. As noted by Mezyar Lotfalian in his recent monograph on Islam, technoscientific identities and the culture of curiosity, there's a glaring lacuna in the literature on science and technology in cross-cultural perspective particularly from the Islamic world, where according to Lotfalian, there are only really two lines of work that have been done at all. Um, first, there's, there's a bit of scholarship on the Islamic medieval sciences, sort of what happened centuries ago. And then more recently, there has been uh, an argument about the so-called clash of civilizations between Western science and Islamic science, going along with the Samuel Huntington thesis about class of, clash of civilizations. Um, and so there's a, a really a dearth of relevant scholarship on Islamic technoscience, broadly speaking, and this also applies to the study of ARTs. Um, there is a, a very important volume called Third Party Assisted Conception Across Cultures, Social, Legal, and Ethical Perspectives, which was published in 2004, and not a single Muslim country is represented among the 13 country case studies. And so, uh, you know, no Muslim world in, in that book. Now, IVF, so this is an IVF laboratory in Beirut, Lebanon, but IVF was actually first practiced in 1986 in the Sunni Muslim-majority countries of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. And Egypt's early entrance into assisted reproduction was especially important from an Islamic standpoint. The Grand Sheikh of Egypt's renowned religious university, Al-Azhar, issued the first widely authoritative fatwa on assisted reproduction on March 23, 1980, which was only two years after the birth of Louise Brown in England, but a full six years before the opening of Egypt's first IVF center in 1986. And so he really presaged the development of IVF in the region. He was very early in his thinking on this topic. And a fatwa, just to reiterate, is a non-legally binding, but nonetheless authoritative Islamic religious opinion usually offered by an Islamic cleric who's considered to be an expert concerning the Islamic scriptures and jurisprudence. 
And interestingly, more than 30 years later, this original Al-Azhar fatwa has proved to be quite authoritative and enduring. And it's subsequently been reissued many times in Egypt as well as across the Sunni Muslim world in places like Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Malaysia, Kuwait, Morocco, and so on. So I want to tell you what that Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar said and what has been sort of allowed by the Sunni Islamic religious authorities. In general, they have been very permissive in allowing assisted reproductive technologies to be practiced. They have allowed artificial insemination with the husband's sperm as long as it goes into the wife's uterus. So you can do artificial insemination husband. In vitro fertilization with an egg from a wife and the sperm from the husband is absolutely fine as long as the embryos go back into the uterus of the wife. This interest cytoplasmic sperm injection, the topic of my new book called ICSI, is allowed as long as you're using eggs from the wife and sperm from the husband. Cryopreservation, you can freeze any excess embryos as long as those embryos are used by the same married couple. Postmenopausal pregnancy could be done as long as the woman cryopreserves her own oocytes or embryos and then uses them in a future cycle past menopause, and this is being done all the time. Postmenopausal women can get pregnant through ARTs. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is allowed and being used for couples at high risk of genetic disorders and their offspring. And interestingly, multi-fetal pregnancy reduction, which is a form of selective abortion, um, is allowed by the Sunni Islamic authorities. It is used often in ART cycles because often three, four, five, six embryos are put back into a woman's uterus and it can become a quadruplet pregnancy, quintuplets and so forth, very dangerous for the woman. The fetuses often don't survive. And so what they do is go in selectively with potassium chloride and selectively abort the fetuses by injecting the potassium chloride into the fetal heart. Um, and so it's a sort of selective abortion. And one could say that Islam is actually rather permissive regarding abortion because it's not believed that conception begins at the you know, sort of moment of conception, that life begins. Rather, insolment occurs between 40 and 120 days, depending on the Islamic legal school. So there's a lot of this multifetal pregnancy reduction being done in the Middle East. Embryo research is also allowed on donated embryos, as long as it's for the advancement of science and the benefit of humanity. And in the future, when it becomes technically possible, uterine transplantation will be allowed as a remedy for a woman who's lacking a competent uterus. And it has already been tried, the first country being Saudi Arabia. So that is, you know, sort of a long list of what is permitted. However, I would say that the Sunni Muslim countries of the Middle East can't be described as a kind of anything goes environment. The Sunni religious authorities have not condoned every possible practice in ART. And so the list of restrictions is equally long. Most important, and this is the most important one, third party donors are not allowed, whether they are providing donor sperm, donor eggs, donor embryos, or donor uteruses, as in surrogacy. The use of a third party, party is tantamount to zinna, or adultery, and I'm going to say something more about that. So all forms of surrogacy, whether it be gestational, woman as, you know, rent a womb, or traditional surrogacy where the woman provides her own egg, no surrogacy is allowed. Um, the donor or surrogate children conceived through any of these sort of illegitimate means cannot be made legitimate, including through adoption. The child who results from a forbidden method belongs to the mother and is considered to be a walid zinna or an illegitimate child. Assisted reproduction cannot be performed on an ex-wife or a widow using sperm from a divorced or dead husband. This is called posthumous ART, and it is done in Euro-America, but not allowed by the Sunni authorities. Sperm banks are strictly forbidden. Um, sperm can only be cryopreserved before cancer treatment and used later in life by that same individual. PGD, or sperm sorting techniques for the purposes of sex selection, are forbidden. Human reproductive cloning for the creation of a cloned child who would be the genetic twin of the cloning parent is forbidden. And in fact, there's been a huge ban, an actual declaration banning human reproductive cloning across the Muslim world. And genetic alteration of embryos is forbidden. 
although in the future gene therapy may be approved to remediate inherited genetic diseases and pathologies and so again this is an equally long list summarizing which technologies are haram or forbidden in sunni islam and i would say most important from the clinical point of view all forms of third party donation are forbidden they are haram sperm donation egg donation embryo donation and surrogacy which is essentially donation of a uterus as noted by Islamic studies scholar Ibrahim Musa from Duke University, in terms of ethics, Muslim authorities consider the transmission of reproductive material between persons who are not legally married to be a major violation of Islamic law. This sensitivity stems from the fact that Islamic law has a strict taboo on sexual relations outside wedlock, zinna. The taboo is designed to protect paternity, i.e. the family, which is designated as one of the five goals of Islamic law, the others being the protection of religion, life, property, and reason. And so with regard to this first issue of marriage and, and zina, Islam is a religion that can be said to privilege, even mandate, heterosexual marital relations. As is made clear in the original Al-Azhar Fatwa, reproduction outside of marriage is considered zina or adultery, which is strictly forbidden. Although third-party donation does not involve the sexual body contact of adulterous relations, or what in the terminology is called touch and gaze. No touch or gaze is done between you know, two people, nor presumably the desire to engage in an extramarital affair. It is nonetheless considered by most Islamic religious scholars to be a form of adultery by virtue of introducing a third party into the sacred diet of husband and wife. It's the very fact that another man's sperm or another woman's eggs enter into a place where they do not belong that makes donation of any kind inherently wrong and threatening to the marital bond. And so marriage is number one sort of justification. The second aspect of third party donation that troubles marriage is the potential for incest among the offspring of anonymous donors. If an anonymous sperm donor, for example, fathers hundreds of children, as we know is happening from the New York Times story that showed that some men in America now have 150 or more children from their sperm donation, and here on the cover of Newsweek this week, you got your sperm where? How to get pregnant fast, cheap, and in public. Here in the Bay Area, <laughs> here in the Bay Area, they are calling themselves not metrosexuals, donor sexuals, men who just basically have sex with themselves for the purposes of donating mostly to lesbian couples. And so the story is all about how you can get fast, free, and cheap. It's actually free, um, and it's like exchanged in bathrooms and Starbucks and so forth, okay? All in, <laughs> all in, all in this week's Newsweek. Um, but it's actually become sort of a, a major ethical issue being discussed right now in, in America about the fact that we've got all of these donor children who are half siblings and could they potentially grow up and meet and marry. And so this really could happen. Unwittingly, you know, children who didn't know that they had the same donor parent could meet each other, fall in love and marry, and they would be basically in a half sibling union, a kind of incest. So in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, moral concerns have been raised about this um, for a long time and you know, basically saying, you know, this is very wrong, we want to prevent incest from occurring. Now, the final moral concern is that third party donation confuses issues of kinship, kinship, descent, and inheritance. As with marriage, Islam is a religion that can be said to privilege, even mandate, biological inheritance. Preserving the origins of each child, meaning his or her relations to a known biological father and mother, is considered not only an ideal in Islam, but a moral imperative. And the problem with third party donation, therefore, is that it destroys a child's origins, nasab. It's a word meaning genealogy or kinship or descent. And the concern is not only about you know, the genealogy, but there's a sort of a moral concern about child rights here. Um, you know, the authorities argue that each child should have legal rights to known parentage. And it's therefore immoral, cruel, and unjust for a child not to know who its biological progenitors are. And I have heard a lot about this in my own work. The, and I've talked to hundreds of Muslims who use the term mixture of genealogy or mixture of relations to describe this untoward outcome. 
Such a mixture of relations, the literal confusion of lines of descent introduced by third party donation, is described as being very dangerous, forbidden, against nature, against God, or haram, morally unacceptable. It's argued that donation, by allowing a stranger to enter the family, confuses lines of descent in Islamic societies. And for men in particular, this is important, um, ensuring paternity and the purity of patrilineage through known fathers is a paramount concern. Because most Muslim societies around the world, with only a few exceptions, most of them are very patrilineal. They are concerned about having male descent you know, perpetuated through the generations. Um, and so people want to know that paternity is being ensured, that fathers know who their sons are, that sons know who their fathers are, and so on. So this is a huge issue for men, patrilineality and paternity. So accordingly, there was a big meeting, the Ninth Islamic Law and Medicine Conference held under the auspice of a Kuwait-based organization. There are about three Islamic bioethical organizations in the Middle Eastern region. This one's called the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences, based in Kuwait. A big meeting was held in Casablanca, Morocco, and a landmark five-point declaration was uh, proclaimed at that meeting, including recommendations to prohibit all situations in which a third party invades a marital relationship through donation of reproductive material. And basically, there is now a ban, a kind of really a religiously inspired ban on third party reproductive assistance in all of the Sunni dominant countries of the Muslim world beyond the Middle East, going into South Asia, Southeast Asia. Not a single Muslim majority country allows either gamete donation or surrogacy, and couples who need these technologies are told firmly that third party donation is against the religion. And if they insist, they're actually told to leave and go out to Euro America. Um, it's simply not practiced in places like Egypt and the Arab Gulf. So that is sort of summarizing the Sunni Islamic position on these technologies. Now we need to talk about the emergence of egg donation. The situation is changing for Shia Muslims, whose leading clerics have taken a radical step in a new direction. Shia, as you probably know, is the minority branch of Islam, constituting slightly more than 10% of the world's Muslim population, and Iran is the current demographic epicenter of the Shia world, um, where it constitutes the majority religion, and one-third of the world's Shia Muslims live in Iran. Um, Shia majorities are also found in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Bahrain, um, significant Shia minority populations are found in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, in Syria, Turkey, and then in the South Asian countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Um, and so people like Juan Cole and others are just calling this the Shia crescent. They're trying to show the kind of geography, a crescent-shaped geography of the dominant spread of Shia, or, you know, the geography of Shia. Now, many Shia religious authorities support the majority Sunni view. Namely, they agree with the Sunni fatwas that prohibit third-party reproductive assistance. However, in 1999, the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Ayatollah Ali al-Hussein al-Khamenei, who is the hand-picked successor to Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini, issued a fatwa effectively permitting donor technologies to be used. With regard to egg donation, Ayatollah Khamenei stated in his fatwa that egg donation is not in and of itself legally forbidden. But he stated that both the egg donor and the infertile mother must abide by the religious codes regarding parenting. Thus the child of the egg donor has the right to inherit from her as the infertile woman who received the eggs is considered to be like an adoptive mother. And with regard to sperm donation, Ayatollah Khamenei said in his fatwa that the baby born of sperm donation will follow the name of the sperm donor and can only inherit from him since the infertile father is considered to be like an adoptive father. This fatwa by Ayatollah Khamenei has literally opened the door to egg, sperm, and embryo donation in Iran. However, not all Iranian Shia clerics agree with his fatwa, with Ayatollah Khamenei's very permissive decision. For example, in 2006, I attended a two-day conference in Tehran called Embryo and Gamete Donation. It was sponsored by the Avicenna Research Institute in association with the Law and Political Science Faculty of the University of Tehran. 
the conference provided a fascinating example of the kind of rigorous debate that is the norm in Islamic jurisprudence. For example, some clerics, all of them dressed in robes and turbans, and the ones with the black turbans are descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. They're Sayyids. They're considered to be very revered. These ayatollahs were present at the conference, and some got up on stage and argued for donor technologies, and some argued against donor technologies. It was very interesting. And most interesting to me, although I am a non-Muslim American, I was asked to represent the Sunni Muslim position on gamete and embryo donation, including to the entire first row at that conference was of ayatollahs. <laughs> <laughs> That was one of those surreal moments in one's academic life. Um, and I have to actually say, Iran has been good to me. Um, I actually was invited, I actually won an award um, from the Iranian sort of ART community for the work that I've done. Particularly, I mean, I've been writing about Sunni position on this for a long time, but also the Shia materials as well. And I was supposed to go back last year um, to go pick up this award and give a talk. but. My university is on the enemy institution list for Iran. <laughs> Yale is one of 60 enemy institutions, and actually it's caused a lot of trouble for um, Yale scholars and students to go to Iran. And, and basically, the legal counsel at my university basically would not let me go to Iran, though I did get a visa, so, which is a pity, um, because a lot of just interesting things are going on in Iran. Um, and what we, my colleagues and I, would like to say is that Iran is in the midst of an ART revolution. We call it the Iranian ART revolution. Since the new millennium, you know, he made this fatwa in 1999, since the year 2000, all manner of gamete donation, embryo donation, and surrogacy is taking place there. Iran is also leading the way into a Middle Eastern stem cell industry. This millennial moment in Iran has had a major impact on Shia-dominant Lebanon, where I worked. At a Middle East Fertility Society meeting, which was held in Beirut in the year 2000, after Ayatollah Khomeini issued his pro-donation fatwa, the audience of Middle Eastern IVF practitioners literally gasped in shock when a group of Iranian female IVF physicians dressed in black shadors described in great scientific detail the results from their Iranian egg donor program. When questioned by the incredulous audience, these Iranian female physicians explained that Ayatollah Khamenei had issued a fatwa permitting donor technologies to be used as a marriage savior, preventing the marital and psychological disputes that would otherwise arise from remaining childless indefinitely. And I must point out the paradox here. Ayatollah Khamenei is not known for his pro-feminist positions, okay? He's not a feminist. I mean, he's considered very conservative. Yet he's using a kind of gender, a kind of feminist gender argument to say that these technologies should be used because he knows what will happen to women in particular if they're infertile and they cannot conceive, that they'll be abandoned and have marital difficulty, and he said he wants to prevent that. So, in Lebanon, where I worked, the Shia IVF physicians in Lebanon were very quick to respond basically saying they, they're doing it in Iran, we're going to do it in Lebanon. And so they started developing informal egg donation arrangements within their clinics. At first, they used only designated donors, and these were usually female family members or close female friends chosen by the infertile patient. Occasionally, married Shia women who had produced excess eggs were also being asked by clinics to donate their eggs to other couples. However, by 2003, when I first arrived in Lebanon, one of the majority Shia IVF uh, clinics in which I worked had developed a full-fledged anonymous egg donation program and had begun to cater to so-called reproductive tourists coming from other Middle Eastern countries. So now we need to talk about the emergence of reproductive tourism. Indeed, the development of egg donation programs in Iran and Lebanon, the only two Muslim countries in the world to provide donor technologies, has led to the emergence in the new millennium of this thing which is being called reproductive tourism, also known as fertility tourism, procreative tourism, or more neutrally, physicians are calling it cross-border reproductive care, CBRC. It is being defined as the traveling by candidate service recipients from one institution, jurisdiction, or country where treatment is not available to another institution, jurisdiction, or country where they can obtain the kind of medically assisted reproduction they desire. As such, it is part of the more general medical tourism. 
And it was first identified um, really by journalists, the media, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, BBC News, started reporting on this thing called reproductive tourism. And there's been a lot of sort of scholarly speculation about what's motivating the movement of people across borders. And eight reasons, eight restrictions have been forwarded in the, in the literature. First of all, religious, ethical, and religious reasons. You know, countries um, basically have prohibitions, either legal, true laws, or religious ethics, uh, religious issues that I've just sort of pointed out. Um, a service may be unavailable simply because they don't have IVF clinics, no expertise, no equipment. And I must say, this is a huge problem for Sub-Saharan Africa. Very high infertility rates there, very low access to services. Um, supply problems, a problem in Europe, in places like Great Britain, supply problems, shortages and waiting lists, especially for donor eggs. Safety risks, uh, you know, the U.S., for example, has the Food and Drug Administration. We have a lot of concern about safety precautions, and certain techniques are not considered safe in one country, so people skirt them by going to another country where these concerns are not uh, the same. Um, there's been a lot of discrimination in the world of ARTs, especially uh, against categories of individuals particularly gay couples, single women, single men, um, people who want to have children outside of the marital union. Even a country like France does not allow either single women or, or gay couples to use ARTs um, in, in clinics in France. Medical privacy and confidentiality, people fear that their you know, information will be let out into the community. And a huge issue is just success rates. These techniques in the world globally are not that successful. The best clinics have, say, 40% success rates, but if you're in a country with, you know, sort of poor quality clinics, the success rates are lower and people are very concerned about going where they think they'll be able to succeed. And then finally, cost. Cost has been a huge factor. In the United States, one cycle of ARTs costs more than 12,000 US dollars. One cycle of ART with donor egg costs more than 30,000 US dollars. To do surrogacy in the United States with an agency is more than 100,000 US dollars. These are extraordinary costs paid for out of pocket since very, you know, we don't have subsidized health care in this country. So people are, you know, moving around because of these reasons. The two that have been repeatedly cited in the literature are the legal restrictions, what's being called law evasion and cost, comparative cost. Um, and, you know, I, I think those are very, very important, but I want to argue that in this world of, you know, that I work in, a major issue that we should be thinking about um, is religion and what I'm going to call religious resistance. is playing a major role in the flight of some infertile couple, uh, couples to other countries. Um, one of our most famous anthropologists, Talal Assad, has argued in the idea of an anthropology of Islam that the notion of religious resistance is important. And he says, a practice is Islamic because it is authorized by the discursive traditions of Islam and is so taught to Muslims. However, the resistances they encounter from Muslims and non-Muslims are equally the concern of an anthropology of Islam. And I think that this issue of religious resistance or sort of religious... Um, you know, if we don't want to call it re resistance, but people really sort of trying to get around or develop their own local moral responses to ARTs, despite the sort of normative Islamic environment, is very, very important now in the Middle East. On the one hand, three potential solutions to childlessness, which would be third party gamete donation, gestational surrogacy, and child adoption are all widely banned across the Muslim world. There is no child adoption um, in most Muslim countries. On the other hand, not all Muslim couples are reacting similarly to these kinds of religious bans. And so in this regard, we must attempt to understand what Arthur Kleinman, who's one of our most famous medical anthropologists, has called local moral worlds. The moral accounts, which are the commitments of social participants in a local world about what is at stake in everyday experience. When you're faced with a problem like wanting to have a child, what is your own local moral response? What are you going to do? How are you going to think about it? What's at stake for you? And through an ethnography of experience, Kleinman has urged us to pay close attention to moral issues of pain and social suffering, which may accompany the arrival of new biotechnologies around the globe. Local moralities are perhaps best exposed when new health technologies confront deeply embedded religious and ethical traditions. For individuals confronting the moral stances and ambiguities of their local religious traditions, 
they must attempt to make sense of such religious responses while at the same time invoking their own moral subjectivities subjectivities to find acceptable solutions to their own dire health needs and concerns and so in short if we are to speak of an emerging islamic bio ethics then it is important to bear in mind that muslims do not agree on some set of common global norms or you know best practices in the in the world of bio ethics islam as a global religion is obviously not monolithic timeless and unchanging and is noted by james galvin in his book the modern middle east the doctrines and institutions associated with islam or any other religion are not frozen in time they exist within history not outside history and while there are continuities of religious doctrines and institutions the meaning those doctrines and institutions hold for society and the function they play in society evolve through time and what i would like to say is that islam itself is emergent as our individual muslim moral subjectivities although this may sound rather obvious not all muslims are alike some are pious while others are not some are scripturally oriented while others value independent reasoning some follow particular clerics while others consider their primary relationship to be with god some know that they are rule breaking but they hope for god's mercy and forgiveness and others simply do not care having left the religion or having associated themselves with secular humanism communism atheism or science and you know in in talking to hundreds of muslims who are in the world of arts this is how people talk about themselves i'm a man of science i'm secular i'm you know i'm pious people try to describe how they are as muslims and the great diversity within the world's muslims cannot be emphasized enough especially when it comes to um seeking solutions to dire health crises their responses are mediated by a wide variety of emerging values and social forces and so now toward the end here i'd like to conclude by telling you the story of something i'm calling emergent masculinities the story of a guy who i call iyad and his unlikely egg donor iyad was a sunni muslim palestinian man who i met in a mostly shia serving ivf clinic in beirut lebanon iyad had grown up in a refugee camp in saida lebanon With the outbreak of the Lebanese civil war in 1975, Iyad and eight of his 10 siblings fled the country, with the only remaining sibling dying in the war. When Iyad emigrated at the tender age of 15, he left behind his childhood sweetheart, Lubna, who was also his bint ama or his paternal first cousin. He had promised to marry her when the war ended, but the bloody conflict raged on for a full 15 years, followed by 10 years of occupation of southern Lebanon by Israel. Thus Iyad was effectively barred from returning to Lebanon to retrieve his waiting fiance. Eventually at age 30, Iyad married a Palestinian woman from the West Bank of Jordan, who bore him two daughters and a son. They chose to migrate to Kuwait, where Iyad could make a better living as a crane operator in the oil fields. Despite a decent standard of living and company benefits, Iyad's marriage and family life were unhappy. His feelings for his first love Lubna had never waned and this contributed to a marriage fraught with tension and fighting. Furthermore, when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, the Palestinian residents of Kuwait were caught in the middle because their leader Yasser Arafat sided with Saddam Hussein against the Kuwaitis. And so Iyad and his two Palestinian brothers were kidnapped by the Kuwaitis and brutally beaten before being turned over to the American forces in Desert Storm. At this point Iyad fled with his family to Damascus, Syria, where he found a safe haven for his family and schools for his three children. But Iyad could not find work in Syria, a relatively poor and isolated Middle Eastern country without major oil fields. Given few options, he returned by himself to the Arab Gulf, this time to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, where he renewed his work in the petroleum industry. Living by himself for nearly 10 years, Iyad experienced deep loneliness and sexual frustration, and out of desperation, he took his Filipina maid as his lover. Finally, when political conditions in Lebanon improved in May 2000 when Israel left Lebanon, Iyad decided to ask his first love, Lubna, to become his second wife. Lubna had never married during the war years and thus remained a 40-year-old virgin with few if any marital prospects. Iyad proposed and Lubna agreed, although Iyad's first wife vociferously objected. And as for his Filipina lover, I do not know how she responded. 
he he said that she loved him a lot and so it was probably unhappy for her as well he had married Lubna in the summer of 2000 although she continued to live with her husband her mother in Lebanon and he had continued to work in the Gulf because Lubna lived in a United Nations supported refugee camp her rights to exit Lebanon as a refugee were severely restricted moreover the UAE does not grant political asylum or citizenship citizenship rights to foreigners living in the country as newlyweds already in their 40s, Iyad and Lubna faced infertility problems from the beginning of their marriage. Iyad's semen was tested at a laboratory in the UAE where he was deemed to be fertile. Lubna, however, had entered perimenopause, and doctors told her that her chances of conceiving were less than 5%, even with a cycle of IVF. If Iyad had been able to marry Lubna when she was still a teenager, they might have had children together quite easily. But now, at age 41, Lubna needed an egg donor, according to the IVF physicians in the Beirut clinic. She needs eggs, Iyad explained to me. The doctor told me to do this IVF with donor eggs. He didn't tell me I must do this, but he said that she needs this operation to become pregnant. If he sends me to any other hospital or doctor, they will say the same thing. In fact, Iyad had already inquired about Lubna's case at an IVF clinic in an Islamic hospital in Sunni-dominant Jordan, but he was told that Lubna was too old to conceive and that egg donation was not allowed in the religion. As Iyad soon determined, the only option for him and Lubna was to attempt IVF with egg donation in Lebanon. Since Iyad did not reside in Lebanon, he began his career as a reproductive tourist, namely a man who travel or person who travels between countries for so-called cross-border reproductive care. Flying back and forth from Dubai to Beirut on several occasions to deposit his semen in the IVF clinic, Iyad was a man on a mission, namely to get his beloved second wife Lubna pregnant through assisted conception. When I met Iyad and Lubna, they were in the middle of a donor egg cycle. He explained his decision to use donor eggs in this way. In Islam, donation is haram. I mean, in Islam, you should try to get the eggs from the wife and the bizri, which is the Lebanese way of saying sperm, it literally means seeds, seeds are sperm, the bizri from the husband, if you want to make IVF, the eggs from the wife and the bizri from the man, not from outside. Since we're using an egg donor, if I get a baby, it's my son because it's my bizri, but it's not her son because the eggs came from another girl. The other girl, that's her mother. He continued, but my wife, she really needs a child. It's more important to her to be a mother than following the religion. So I don't mind. I'm not too much a Muslim. I pray, but sometimes you should move a little. For her psychology, she needs that baby. I could go to take a baby already born from outside and bring it to our house, i.e. an orphan, but when she puts it in here, and he points to the belly, day by day, she's feeling it growing inside her. It's born from her. She's feeling that it's really her baby. But if I get an orphan from outside, she won't feel it's her baby. And my wife should be its mother because she will care for him in the future and she feels the pains from today and forever. My life, wife loves babies so much and she'll make a great mother because she hasn't any children and she loves children. She wants a baby, she needs a baby. So I'm doing this IVF for her, yes, for her. We're doing it very secretly because maybe it's not a baby who looks like me or his mother and people ask, from where did you get that baby? People will talk. In America, it's normal to use a donor and in Europe, but with us here, it's difficult to do, very difficult. If we are in America or outside the Middle East, it would be normal. But in the Middle East, we'll have to tell people that we did this operation from her eggs and my bizri, so people will believe this is our child. Now, interestingly, despite Iyad's desire to convince the world of a biological conception with his dark-haired, olive-skinned wife, he had become fairly obsessed with a white American egg donor, who he happened to spot in the Lebanese IVF clinic. In fact, this particular Beirut-based clinic employed both Lebanese and American egg donors. The latter were paid an additional $1,000 to travel to the Middle East for egg harvesting. When Iyad spotted the pale-skinned, bleach-blonde donor in her khaki shorts and tank top, he became immediately smitten with her beauty and manner. He extolled her virtues to me in this way. Yesterday, I saw a very beautiful girl outside in the hallway. 
She's American, I'm sure. So I told the doctor, take $1,000 more and give me the eggs from that girl. She was fat a little bit and really, really very beautiful. There was something quiet about her and something about her face. Directly, my eyes went to her. She was really beautiful and my heart opened to her. I, he was wonderful. He was very poetic when he talked. And he continued, half joking and half serious. I hope my wife gets some eggs from that girl because my child shall be coming white, already American. My child, when he comes, he will take the American passport in the future. I then asked Ed why he preferred an American donor. Why not, he exclaimed. American girls are giving their eggs all over the world. In the future, all people will look like they're Americans. <laughs> Whether Iyad and Lubna went on to produce a donor child is unknown, as I never encountered them again at the clinic. I did discover, however, that the eggs of the beautiful American donor were indeed used in Iyad's and Lubna's IVF cycle. According to one of the clinic's embryologists, this fact was a coincidence based on that donor egg's quality, donor's egg quality, rather than acquiescence on the part of the clinic to Iyad's request, or any attempt by Iyad to bribe the clinic for a particular donor's eggs. Now, the egg donor, who I'll call Becky, was entirely unaware of Iad's longing. She was a working class 24-year-old from Michigan, the center of the U.S. auto industry. In Michigan's crumbling economy, foreign egg donation thus represents a financial opportunity for young working class American women such as Becky. A four-time repeat egg donor, Becky was using the $12,000 she had made so far to, as she put it, pay for my past mistakes in the form of significant credit card debt. Having been kicked out of the house by her divorced mother, she had lived on her own since her late teens, making only $450 a week as a bartending waitress. Becky was blunt about needing the extra income egg donation could provide. When I asked her if she was receiving several thousand to donate her eggs in Lebanon, she explained to me, well, not several, but $3,000. If we only stayed in Michigan, it would be $2,000. But if we agreed to travel, it would be $3,000. Other states pay more, for example, $5,000 in Indiana and California. I don't know why, except that California has a higher cost of living. But even $3,000 is something, and I figure that if someone is willing to pay that much money for someone's eggs, then they must really want a child, and they'll be good parents. At that point, I mentioned that she would be helping many couples who would love to have children. Becky responded rather wistfully, the family seemed closer here. I wish it was more like that in the States. When I joked that the resulting babies would be half American, Becky replied, yeah, we were surprised they'd want Americans. As an American Christian, Becky had no moral qualms about donating her eggs to Middle Eastern Muslim couples. She believed that she was performing an altruistic act by allowing couples who desperately wanted a child to become parents. And as we passed by the clinic's, clinic's bulletin board, which was crowded with photos of Lebanese IVF babies, she pointed out to me, this one is mine, based on what she perceived to be the phenotypical similarities that Iyad had so admired, namely the baby's light skin and large, beautiful eyes. Becky's story bespeaks the new global economy of what are being called traveling foreign egg donors who sell their ova for a fee. Generally poor women from resource poor or post-Soviet countries, these traveling foreign egg donors are seen as a vulnerable class of women who sell their gametes much as prostitutes sell their sexual bodies. That traveling foreign egg donors might in fact be Americans from one of the wealthiest countries in the world is surprising. That impoverished American women are traveling to war-torn Middle Eastern countries to sell their gametes for $3,000 is a story that needs to be told. Iyad's story is also morally complex and open to multiple readings and interpretations. From a critical feminist perspective, Iyad could be viewed as a callous, polygynous adulterer who cares little for the feelings of his first wife and mother of his children. Furthermore, Iyad could be accused of being a post-colonial cultural dupe who's been, become convinced of the superiority of America and its citizens. Finally, from a Sunni Islamic perspective, Iyad has committed a kind of triple zina, sex with a woman who is not his wife, the grave sin of fertilizing donor eggs with his sperm, as well as the fantasy zina of a white American egg donor mothering his child. In this reading of Iyad's life, he appears as both a bad man and a bad Muslim. A different and more sympathetic reading of Iyad's story casts him in another light. He is a man who has maintained one true love throughout his lifetime, but who has been thwarted from consummating this love by the circumstances of war. 
in exile, Iyad made second best chances for uh, made second best choices for marital and sexual fulfillment. However, as soon as the political situation reversed, Iyad married Lubna, the love of his life. In so doing, he did not abandon his first wife, which would have left her and their three children economically and socially vulnerable. Polygyny on the part of Iyad signifies his feelings of responsibility toward two women, a first wife who he never really loved, but who is the mother of his children, and a first cousin with whom dreams of marriage were crushed by 25 year, five years of civil war and occupation. I have to point out that under normal circumstances, Iyad and Lubna would probably have married in their late teens or early 20s and would have gone on to become parents of several children. Already the father of three and in his late 40s, Iyad does not desire more children, but he is willing to pr pursue IVF for her because he appreciates Lubna's ardent desires for motherhood. Iyad's decision to overcome Lubna's infertility takes moral courage because in order for Lubna to become a mother, a religiously forbidden technology, egg donation, is required. Iyad justifies this by pointing to Lubna's right to motherhood, his own relaxed approach to religion, and his belief that Islam must move to take advantage of emerging technologies that are widely accepted in Euro-America. In order to access egg donation, Iyad is forced to leave the Sunni-dominant UAE and to help underwrite the costly importation of an American egg donor to Lebanon. Once the process is set in motion, he does not look back, nor does he question the fact that the American egg donor is undoubtedly not a Muslim. In the end, Iyad's story is about double forms of emergence, both technological and masculine. On the one hand, new forms of reproductive technology are continuously emerging, and once they reach the reproductive marketplace, they are being rapidly discussed, debated, and in most cases, deployed in Middle Eastern IVF settings. Egg donation is a case in point. After entering Iran in 1999, it spread within a year to Lebanon, where Shia Muslim couples were the first to access this reproductive technology. But by 2003, when Iyad and Lubna married and decided to try egg donation, Middle Eastern couples from all religions, Sunni, Shia, Druze, and Christian, were beginning to employ this technology in hopes of overcoming age-related and other forms of female infertility. The willingness of many Middle Eastern husbands to accommodate egg donation for their beloved wives is a powerful marker of emergent masculinities across the region. For example, in Iyad's case, he has become a male reproductive tourist, he has engaged in a sophisticated transnational process of egg brokerage, he has demonstrated his marital love and commitment through costly purchase of IVF and donor eggs for her, and he has displayed a form of religious resistance by refusing to abide by Sunni Islamic imperatives. As seen in Iyad's story, the emergence of new forms of assisted reproductive technology have gone hand in hand with emerging masculinities in the region. So in conclusion, it's fair to state that the Muslim world, generally positioned on the receiving end of global reproductive technology transfers, has nonetheless embraced ARTs with considerable enthusiasm, while at the same time reconfiguring them in accordance with local religious moralities. Islam is interpreted, debated, and practiced locally. As such, local forms of the religion must be examined and analyzed. Islamic approaches to gamete donation in Egypt are, as we've seen, now very different from Islamic approaches to gamete donation in Iran and Lebanon. In the Sunni Muslim countries such as Egypt, the prohibition on donor gametes has clearly led to an entrenchment of deeply held religious beliefs about the importance of marriage, biological kinship, and family life, which no third party should tear asunder. For this reason, donor gametes continue to be shunned in the Sunni Muslim world, with donation itself equated to zinna or adultery. Yet having said this, this, the globalization of these technologies to other parts of the Shia Muslim world has fundamentally altered understandings of the ways in which families can be made and the ways in which marriages can be saved through the uses of ARTs. The arrival of donor technologies in Shia, Iran, and Lebanon has led to a brave new world of reproductive possibility never imagined when these technologies were first introduced to the Middle East more than 25 years ago. These technologies have engendered significant medical transnationalism and reproductive tourism, mixing of gametes across global ethnic, national, and religious lines, and the births of thousands of egg donor babies and now 
sperm donor and surrogate babies to otherwise devout infertile Muslim couples. Infertile Muslim couples such as Iyad and Lubna have begun to reconsider traditional notions of biological kinship, even if social parenthood of a donor child is still not widely embraced. Moreover, the availability of donor technologies has effectively weakened the Sunni Muslim ban on third-party donation across the region, with some infertile Sunni Muslim couples, such as Iyad and Lubna, reconsidering their own anti-donation moral stances. As a result, both Shia Muslim and American donor gametes are finding their ways into Sunni, their ways into Sunni Muslim bodies, a global exchange of gametes that certainly defies East-West stereotypes and that was never imagined when IVF was first invented in England more than 30 years ago. Thank you.